Air Force's long-range airlifter that performed yeoman service through two wars and nearly 25 years, the C-124, nicknamed Old Shaky, was a major redesign of the C-74 Globemaster that was developed at the end of World War II. The C-124 used the same wings and tail and engines as the C-74. It was capable of handling such bulky cargo as tanks, field guns, bulldozers, and trucks, up to 74,000 pounds of cargo. It could also be converted into a transport capable of carrying 200 fully equipped troops in its double-deck cabin or 123 litter patients and their attendants. Okay, well up here the pilot and the co-pilot each had throttles. Uh, the only time they really used them was on the ground for taxing and they would start them up for takeoff and they would control them on landing. To, and they had a, as far as the, they had a prop control, they had a mixture control, but all of that went through the flight engineer station and it's rare if ever that they would use it. Uh, over here on this side are the pilot's flight instruments. On the other side, the co-pilot has an identical set over there. They're completely independent so that you have redundancy in case any one should fail, the other system would still be operational. Over here is your control for bringing up the landing gear. The co-pilot would bring it up on the pilot's command once he had his uh, rate of climb established after takeoff. Over here on the left is a radar screen. This was used for weather. The very early models, A models, like this one, when it came out of the factory, they didn't have it at that time, but it was later put into the aircraft. And the steering wheel over here, this is for your ground steering, the control of the, the nose gear for steering on the ground. And over here on the far left, there's a couple of levers, which was for emergency, they were air brakes. In case of hydraulic system failure, you still had a backup system for brakes to get you stopped. And on landing, after you landed, the pilot would pull his back and then he could take them and pull them way back and go into reverse and uh, then you could use the engine and props for braking action help slow you down these are all uh, radio and navigation instruments trim tab for the rudder trim tab for the elevators the flight engineer station here. Most of the systems except for the flight instruments and the navigation instruments went through the flight engineers panel. We had all these, one for each engine. So there's 48 engine instruments here on the flight engineers panel. Monitor everything that goes on on them. From the flight engineers station you start engines do the engine run up and once they started down the runway the pilot would he'd start the throttles up and then he'd call for takeoff or for max power and you'd follow him up and maintain max power till you got airborne as soon as he called got the uh, gear coming up he'd call for meto and you'd bring back the pot the, the props this was your uh, main prop control here and uh, the throttle mixtures okay. The, uh, and the mixtures. Once you got in cruise uh, on long range flights, you manually leaned out the engines to get maximum uh, fuel economy out of them. Over here, you had your carburetor heat to if you was in icing conditions, or you could get carburetor icing. You, you use carburetor heat to make sure that you didn't get car, uh, carburetor icing. Uh, fuel. These were for controlling the fuel tanks. This was a six tanker. If you happen to have a C model, that was a 12 tanker, and they had electric uh, control of the, of the uh, fuel there for booster pumps and the, the uh, various valves to route the fuel to the engines. This is the nav navigator position on the C-124. Uh, this is our Loran long-range navigation. And we have a, a radar 
it's basically a, a, a weather radar primarily, and there's a repeater up in the uh, pilot's position in the front. This is our radar altimeter, and uh, up here is the sextant mount for celestial navigation. There were three main ways of getting, this is primarily a cargo aircraft, and there were three main ways of getting cargo into the aircraft. Through troop doors and stairs on each side, through this elevator platform, and we would have a winch up above with cables to all four corners of this elevator platform. We would open underneath, just like a bomb bay door, and lower that to the ground, and you'd have to manually load the boxes and you'd bring that back into the aircraft and you could slide it forward along the rail so you wouldn't have to carry the, the cargo as far. The third way of getting cargo into the aircraft is through the nose. The nose doors would open, they're called clamshell doors, and the two ramps that you see there were extended down and you could drive vehicles into the aircraft. The numbers you see along the side are the number of inches from the nose of the aircraft. And the purpose of those is so you could balance the aircraft. And you couldn't put too much weight in the front or into the, the rear, you had to balance it. And just like a, a passenger with a seat assignment, all the cargo that came in also had an assigned place. There are some photos over here of the aircraft uh, in its restoration process. One of them shows the ramps down with the vehicle being driven off, and here is one of the of a helicopter being uh, winched off the, the, uh, through the nose doors. This aircraft came from Offutt of Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. In order to get it into Dover, we had to take off the, the engines, the wings, the tail, the gear, and then we had to actually slice the fuselage in half and it just barely fit in, inside a C-5. And then we flowed it, flew it in here, and then we had to reassemble it and, and put all the rivets back in to, to hold it back. What you see here is the upper decking, and this is an example of how it looked when you, when you put it down. We didn't put cargo up there. We had, it wasn't uh, stressed for the, to take the uh, weight of the cargo. But we would have four rows of seats in the cargo main cabin, and then we would have four rows of seats on the upper decking. And with that arrangement, we carry approximately 400 people in here. Now, you could trade off the seating for litter. So if you wanted to have litter patients, you would just replace the, the seating with litters. Uh, this is the ladder here that uh, is used to get up onto the upper decking. This aircraft is somewhat unique in virtue of the fact that you had tunnels that went out to the, through the wings so that you could access the inboard and outboard engines while in flight. You would go down through this compartment and then there's the tunnel that extends through, through the wing. The primary purpose, or not maybe the primary, but at least one of the main purposes of doing that is that each engine had a generator. And just like an automobile, the generator would sometimes fail, overheat. So if that happened, you had to shut the engine down. But the engine was still good. Then you would have somebody go through the tunnels, and you'd have them physically take the generator off the engine, dis disconnect it, and then you could restart the engine, you could have the power of the engine again. And then the other three generators could supply your electrical power as, as, without any kind of a problem.